Derek Prince Ministries, proclaiming the inspired Word of God around the world. Derek Prince is an internationally recognized Bible teacher and author. Through books, audios, videos and radio broadcasts, Derek seeks to reach the unreached and teach the untaught. In over 50 years of ministry, Derek has reached over 100 nations in more than 50 languages. And now, Derek Prince. I have not always been a successful husband. I've failed many times, but I can say one thing. My, my first wife, who was Danish and very outspoken, she said, the only thing that's kept you faithful to me is the fear of God. <laughs> And I thought to myself, that's not such a bad statement as it sounds. I mean, it did keep me. My brothers and sisters, let's be realistic. There are temptations in a marriage. There are very few men who don't experience some temptation to break their marriage vows. What keeps you from doing it? I'll tell you what kept me from doing it. The fear of God. The fear of God is clean and endures forever. It's purifying, it's sanctifying. Well, let's go on. Proverbs 10, verse 27. The further we go, the more exciting it gets. I hope at least I've done one thing by the time i finished. I've given you a desire to know more about the fear of the Lord. Proverbs 10, verse 27 says this. The fear of the Lord prolongs days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. So listen. If you have the fear of the Lord in your life, you will, longer, you will live longer than you would have without it. It doesn't tell you how long it will live, but you'll live longer than you would have lived without the fear of the Lord in your life. And I've, had, I've, I've lived a long life and I need some more life, years of life because my job on earth is not finished. And I tell you, I'm very careful to cultivate the fear of the Lord because it prolongs life. Who would turn that down? The only people who would turn that down are people who are totally unbelieving or totally ignorant. You cannot afford to live without the fear of the Lord. All right. Then Proverbs 14, 26 is one of the most amazing verses in the Bible. And you probably didn't even know it was there. Why? Because you don't search the scriptures. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence. Doesn't make you timid. Doesn't make you weak. It gives you strength. You fear the Lord, you don't have to fear anything else. It's the remedy for all other ungodly forms of fear. And then I think this is my favorite one. And I just want to ask you, how could you turn down a promise like this? Proverbs 19:23. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. Dear brother and sister, how can you turn down an offer like that? I mean, you, 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 you're really out of your mind. The fear of the Lord leads to life. He who has it will abide in satisfaction and will not be visited with evil. I have to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, that's my promise. I want it. I can't believe, I can hardly believe that God would make an offer like that on the basis of one thing, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord, verse 27. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to avoid the snares of death. And then Proverbs 22, verse 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. See, the fear of the Lord does not go with pride. You cannot mix it with pride. It's a remedy for all pride. But by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. And I don't want to be in any way arrogant, but I have to say, I've proved that in my experience. I can say it's true. It's true in the life of Derek Prince. Not because I deserve it, but because I've met the conditions. 
I have a record of serving the Lord for 58 years. And he's given me riches, spiritual riches and some material riches. You know, I became a Pentecostal when no Pentecostal ever expected that they have any money. When my first wife and I got married, we never believed we'd own a car. To be Pentecostal was to be poor. I mean, that's the way it was. It was also to be uneducated. When I came back from the Middle East to Britain and tried to make myself known to the Pentecostals in Britain, God bless them, when they heard that I'd been a fellow of King's College, Cambridge, they couldn't believe that I was a Christian. <laughs> I, I'm not exaggerating, I'm telling you the truth. I had to sit with them a long while and convince them. I speak in tongues. In spite of having been a fellow of King's College, Cambridge, in spite of having been a scholar of Eton, I speak in tongues, just the same as you do. <laughs> today, I think it's rather the other way around. I think we're too concerned to be rich today. Some of us. I think not me. <laughs> well, I mean, you're the one to decide that, Lord, not me. All right, now, I want to give you just quickly some pictures of the fear of the Lord in the life of God's people. And we'll turn to Psalm 2. Psalm 2, verse 11. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. That doesn't make sense to the carnal mind. How can you have fear and rejoicing? How can you be trembling and rejoicing? But you see, that's the spiritual combination. The two go together, the fear of the Lord and trembling, rejoicing and trembling. And then in the, in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 9, a description of the early church. Acts 9, verse 31. Acts 9, 31. Then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified or built up. And walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. You see, the carnal mind can't understand that. The fear of the Lord and the comfort of the Holy Spirit, how can they go together? But they do. And they should never be separated. And as a result, they were edified and they multiplied. In other words, that's the key to church growth the fear of the Lord, and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. But our little natural minds say, how can I mix fear and comfort? You can't, but God can. And he does. And then I want to speak about, uh, this is the thing that, I've just written a book called Husbands and Fathers, so I know all about this from experience. And I'll tell you, there are certain things that women object to. And one is being told to submit. <laughs> and I don't blame them, because it's taken out of context. Listen, I want to read two, two verses in Ephesians chapter 5. And in my Bible, these two verses are separated by a subheading put in by the editors, so that the two things are co totally separated. It says about walking in the Holy Spirit, and this is one of the marks of being full of the Holy Spirit, incidentally, is submitting to one another in the fear of God. So all Christians should have a submissive attitude to all other Christians. Then it says, wives, submit yourselves to your husband. But when we take it out of the context, it sounds like wives are the ones who have to do all the submitting. And that's the way it's often been presented to women. But the teachers who present it to women should themselves be submitted should themselves be walking in the fear of the Lord. Well, I have no problem with women. I never have had. <laughs> well, I've been married 50 years. 30 years to my first wife, 20 years to my second wife. And both of them are now with the Lord. And I'm looking forward to joining them. But I've got a little more to do before I do. But I've had two happy, successful marriages. And I am the head of a family which now numbers 150 plus persons. Some people say, well, if I have so many children, I couldn't serve the Lord. 
nonsense. Nonsense. Now, people say, well, I'm saved. I don't need the fear of the Lord. That's when you need it most. Let me show you in 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 through 19. And remember, this is written to people who've been redeemed by the blood of Jesus. But as he is, who has called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct all your conduct, not some of it. Because it is written, be holy for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your sojourning here in fear. Whom was it written to? People redeemed by the blood of Jesus. What did it say? Conduct the time of your sojourning here in fear. And why? Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The very fact that God paid our redemption with the blood of Jesus, the most precious thing in the universe, is a reason why we should always walk in fear. Fear that we somehow betray our Redeemer. Fear that somehow we lower the price of our redemption to something cheap and insignificant. That's the mark of a committed Christian. That's the mark of a Christian who understands what it costs God to redeem him. Brothers and sisters, I am really anxious not to do anything that would in any way belittle the price of the blood of Jesus. He paid for me with his precious blood. I don't want to make that cheap. I don't want to act as if it wasn't the supreme sacrifice of God. If God was willing to sacrifice that much for me, how can I lead a carnal, self-indulgent, self-pleasing life? How can I be more occupied with what I want than what God wants? It's the most, in a way, I, I say this, I'll offend you, but one of the most terrifying things in my life is God paid, with me, paid for me with the blood of Jesus. No, the most precious thing in the universe. I didn't deserve it. I was totally unworthy, and so were you. But if God paid that much for you, how can you act as if you were cheap? How can you act as if your redemption didn't cost God the most precious thing that he ever had? The very fact of our redemption is a challenge to holiness. Finally, and when I say finally, like Brother Ed Cole, you have to understand in the context. <laughs> I think it will be finally, but I don't guarantee. I want to read just briefly from Proverbs chapter 2. Proverbs 2, verses 1 through 5. And this is how you can receive the fear of the Lord. I don't want to leave you just with an idea that's something tremendously important that you need, but you don't know how to get it, because here is the answer. It's in the first five verses of Proverbs chapter 2. <clears throat> and it begins with an if. In other words, there are conditions to be fulfilled. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, yes, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then, then, you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So the then comes after the if. What are the conditions? Let me go through them briefly. If you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, that is, we receive God's word with respect, with an attitude of submission and, and obedience. We receive it as the most valuable thing in life. Treasure it. <coughs> The Hebrew word means to store something up in a secret place because it's the most valuable thing you have. That's condition number one, receiving God's word. 
Condition number two, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding. You know something about the human body? You cannot incline your ear without bowing your head. Did you know that? There's no way your, head, your ear can move apart from your head. So when you incline your ear, what do you do? You bow down your head. You become submissive and teachable. When I was a trainer of teachers in Kenya, which was a long while ago, it may have changed now, but when a pupil came up to a teacher in an African school, he would come with his exercise book like this, and he would bow. And you know what that was saying? You're the teacher, I'm the pupil. And that's how we should come to God. You're the teacher, I'm the pupil. I receive your words. I do not argue with them. I do not reason them away. I do not explain them as out of date, because the fear of the Lord endures forever. It's never out of date. Verse 3, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding. So that's prayer, impassioned prayer, crying out for discernment, lifting up your voice for understanding. And then verse 4, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasure, it's, it's a search. God doesn't put everything right out in the open. That verse that I quoted from Isaiah 33, 6, you have to search to find it. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. You can read that many, many times and not even notice it's there. God doesn't put his jewels right out on the pavement for anybody to pick up. He puts them in places where you have to grasp for them and grope for them. All right, we come now to the end. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord. So it's not an easy thing. It's not something cheap. It's not something too simple. The arrogant man said, I don't need that. I'm clever. Let me tell you, I, we, when I was at school at Cambridge, we used to make fun of the religious people. And we quoted to them, I think it's a poem of Longfellow, be good, sweet maid, and let who will be clever. And we, we laughed. He said, you can be good, but we're clever. <laughs> You know what? I've met far more clever people in my life than I have met good people. It's much easier to be clever than it is to be good. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. And I don't believe those things can ever be separated. The knowledge of God can never be separated from the fear of the Lord. You'll remember that in Isaiah 11 it said, the fear of the Lord will make him, the Holy Spirit will make him a quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the knowledge of the Lord. You cannot separate the knowledge of the Lord from the fear of the Lord. You don't have more knowledge of the Lord in your life than you have fear of the Lord. I'm not talking about the ungodly fear. I'm not talking about the tormenting fear. I'm not talking about the religious fear that's taught by the precept of men. I'm talking about a fear that only the Holy Spirit can teach. Come, you children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Bless his wonderful name. He's willing to do it. I am so amazed at the grace of God. I've been a Christian for 58 years. I tell you, I'm much more amazed at the grace of God in my life than I was when I first, first saved. <laughs> I've discovered all the things that God had to deal with. I mean, if I'd been God, I wouldn't have taken me on, I'll tell you that. <laughs> but he did. And he's taken you, you on. <laughs> and if, you, if you'd been God, you wouldn't have taken yourself on, I know. <laughs> he's marvelous. Oh, he's so gracious. You know the word grace? We've so misinterpreted it. It's God's undeserved favor his love, his compassion, that we've done nothing to deserve. In fact, we've done everything not to deserve it. But you can't earn it. You cannot earn grace. Anything you can earn is not grace. There's only one way to receive it, by faith. Stop trying to earn it. You see, all religious people have got the idea that they've got to earn something. Well, there are things we do earn, but not grace. Grace comes free. 
received by faith. So, let me read those words again. And I, I commend them to you. I think I can say them by heart. I won't do it, I don't want to be arrogant or boastful, but Ruth and I memorized those first five verses of chapter two many times over. My son, if you receive my words and treasure my commands within you, condition number one, condition number two, so that you incline your ear to wisdom and apply your heart to understanding, condition number two, if you cry out for discernment and lift up your voice for understanding, passionate prayer, condition number three, if you seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, condition number four, a diligent, motivated search, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. How precious, how wonderful. Now, I've come to the end of my message, but it would be unfair to leave you with nothing but a message. I want you to think over for a few moments what I've been saying. And then I want you to consider whether you'll do this, whether you'll ask God to impart to you the fear of the Lord. He won't do it against your will. And he won't threaten you. He offers, but you have to receive. And you may be here today and you are a sincere Christian, I'm sure you are, but really you, there's very little of the fear of the Lord in your life. And for that reason, to say the truth and tell you it is like it is, there's very little holiness. Because the fear of the Lord cannot be separated from holiness, nor holiness from the fear of the Lord. Listen, I, 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 have, a, I have a large family, and praise God, almost all of them are walking with the Lord, which is one of them. I mean, I, I thank God day and night for him, but I'll tell you this. It's very easy to take God for granted. Most of, I think all of my children have known the Lord from childhood. They've walked with the Lord. But there can come a time in any person's life when you take things for granted that you have no right to take for granted. Well, here I am. I've done my best. If you really feel here tonight that God has been awakening you to a need in your life of the fear of the Lord, which is clean and endures forever, which prolongs your life, I'm going to suggest that you just do this in a moment. Don't do anything right now. But just to apply what I've been teaching. And if you're already walking in the fear of the Lord, don't do it. Praise God for you. But if you have to acknowledge, Lord, I've, I've lived by the standards of the church. I go to church and I listen to sermons and I put money in the offering, but this fear of the Lord you've been talking about, I've really never heard about that in church. Is that true? <laughs> true of most churches. And I'm not a critic of churches. In fact, I believe passionately in being part of a church. I've never found a perfect church. And if I did, I couldn't join it, because then it wouldn't be perfect, see? <laughs> but both my first wife and my second wife, we have always made it a principle to be part of a local congregation. And when we went out on our journeys, they sent us out, and when we came back, we reported to them. Imperfect as they were, they were better, better, better than nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Well, well, anyhow, listen. And don't, don't tell me that you're much better than I am, because I don't believe it. Now, seriously, you really have heard something tonight that stirred your desire. You have an appetite for something more. 
How terrible to provide food for people who don't have an appetite. But tonight you heard something. There is something here. This fear of the Lord. It's something I've never really understood. I'd nobody ever told me about it, but I see it's all the, in the Bible from beginning to end, from Genesis to Revelation. And whatever it is, Lord, I don't understand it fully, but I want it. Now, if that's the way you feel, and I want you to be very careful, because it's easy to respond in an atmosphere like this and go out and forget what you've done, which will not please God. But if you are here tonight and you say, Brother Prince, after listening to you, I realize I have had no understanding of the fear of the Lord. I didn't know what it was. I didn't appreciate it. But I really want it. I want to ask God to give it to me. I want to ask God here tonight to give it to me. If that's what you want, I'm not going to call people forward to the front. But I just want you, if that's your response, I want you to stand to your feet right where you are right now. And I'm going to ask the, the uh, musicians to come and lead us in the singing of a song, which I believe is appropriate. But now I want you, who are standing, to just quietly, without being, making yourself too audible, just I want you to say these words to the Lord. When you, are you ready? Say these words. O oh God, my Father, I come to you through Jesus Christ, my Savior. And tonight you have put in my heart a desire for the fear of the Lord. And I'm asking you from now on to lead me, to teach me, and to impart to me this wonderful treasure of the Lord the fear of the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. And now take just a little while to shut yourself in with God and commune with him, and then the musicians are going to lead us in a final act of worship. <laughs>